I sat in the sterile examination room, my hands gripping the edge of the paper-covered table. The crinkle of the paper seemed deafening in the silence. My mind raced, replaying the events of the past few weeks that had led me to this moment. It had started with a persistent cough that I couldn't shake. Then came the fatigue that seeped into my bones, making even the simplest tasks feel like climbing a mountain. I brushed it off as stress from work, maybe a stubborn cold. But Beth, ever attentive, had noticed the weight loss, the night sweats. She'd finally convinced me to see a doctor. Now, two years later, I found myself staring at the stark white walls of this room, waiting for the doctor to return with results that would change everything. The door opened and Dr. Patel entered, a manila folder in her hands. Her face was a mask of professional calm, but I could see the tension in her shoulders. Joseph, she said, her voice gentle, I'm afraid I have some difficult news. The words washed over me like ice water, cancer, the big C. It was like a punch to the gut, knocking the wind out of me. I barely heard the rest of what she said, something about further tests determining the stage. I don't remember much of the drive home. Beth's hand was on my knee, a steady presence as the world outside blurred past. We didn't speak. What was there to say? At home, we sat on the edge of our bed, the silence heavy between us. Beth's eyes were red-rimmed, but she hadn't cried. Not yet. What do we do now? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself. We wait, I guess, for the other tests. Beth nodded, her hand finding mine. Should we tell the family? I thought about it for a moment. Papa would want to know immediately. He'd probably have some old remedy or story about someone who beat cancer by drinking dandelion tea or something. Dad would go into problem-solving mode, researching treatments and doctors. And Grandma... Well, she wasn't with us anymore, but I could almost hear her soothing voice telling me everything would be all right. Not yet, I decided. Let's wait until we know more. No sense in worrying everyone until we have all the facts. Beth squeezed my hand. Okay, she agreed. We'll face this together, whatever comes. I looked at her then, really looked at her. Her brown hair was pulled back in a messy ponytail, and she wore one of my old T-shirts. Her eyes, usually so warm and full of life, were shadowed with worry. But there was determination there, too, a fierce love that made my throat tighten. I love you, I said, the words feeling inadequate for the depth of what I felt. She leaned into me, her head resting on my shoulder. I love you, too. We sat there as the sun set, casting long shadows across our bedroom. The world outside continued on, oblivious to the seismic shift that had just occurred in our lives. Cars passed by on the street, a dog barked in the distance, and somewhere a child laughed. I thought about all the things I'd taken for granted, the way the morning light filtered through our kitchen window, the smell of fresh coffee, the sound of Beth's laughter, simple things that suddenly seemed infinitely precious. We should make a list, I said abruptly. Beth lifted her head, looking at me quizzically. A list? I nodded, feeling a surge of energy. Of all the things we want to do, places we want to see, just in case. I couldn't finish the sentence, but Beth understood. She always did. Okay, she said, getting up to fetch a notebook and pen from her desk. Where should we start? We spent the next few hours talking, laughing, and sometimes crying as we filled pages with our dreams and wishes. It felt good to focus on something other than the fear and uncertainty that loomed over us. As we got ready for bed that night, I caught sight of myself in the bathroom mirror. I looked the same as I always had, a bit of gray at my temples, laugh lines around my eyes. But everything felt different now. I was different. The waiting room was a blur of muted colors and hushed voices. Beth's hand was clasped tightly in mine, her thumb tracing circles on my palm. We'd been here for what felt like hours, waiting for the final results of my tests. A nurse called my name, and we followed her down a long corridor. The click of her shoes echoed off the sterile walls, each step bringing us closer to a truth we weren't sure we were ready to face. Dr. Patel's office was small but warm, with framed diplomas on the walls and a potted plant in the corner. She greeted us with a somber smile, gesturing for us to take a seat. Joseph, Beth, she began, her voice gentle but firm. I'm afraid the news isn't good. I felt Beth's hand tighten in mine. 
the room seemed to shrink, the air growing thick and heavy. Dr. Patel continued, her words cutting through the fog in my mind. The cancer has spread further than we initially thought. It's in your lungs, liver, and there are signs it's reaching your bones. I heard Beth's sharp intake of breath beside me. My own chest felt tight, like I couldn't get enough air. What? What does that mean? I managed to ask, my voice sounding strange and distant to my own ears. Dr. Patel's eyes were filled with compassion as she looked at us. It means that we're dealing with stage 40 cancer. At this point, complete recovery is impossible. The words hit me like a physical blow. I'd known it was bad, but hearing it laid out so starkly. How long? Beth's voice was barely above a whisper. Dr. Patel hesitated for a moment. Without treatment, we're looking at about six months. With aggressive treatment, we might be able to extend that to a year, possibly a bit longer. A year, at most. The room spun around me, and I gripped the arms of my chair to steady myself. But there are treatment options? Beth pressed, her voice taking on a desperate edge. Chemo? Radiation? Something? Dr. Patel nodded. Yes, there are options. We can start an aggressive chemotherapy regimen combined with targeted radiation. It won't cure the cancer, but it could slow its progression and potentially give you more time. I found my voice again. And the side effects? They can be severe, Dr. Patel admitted. Nausea, fatigue, hair loss. The treatment itself can be grueling. I nodded, trying to process it all. A year of life, but at what cost? Beth spoke up, her voice trembling but determined. We'll do it, whatever it takes, right, Joseph? I looked at her, saw the fear and love warring in her eyes. I wanted to agree, to fight with everything I had, but a part of me wondered if it was worth it. A year of suffering, of watching Beth worry and fret. I... I need some time to think about it, I said finally. Dr. Patel nodded, understanding. Of course, this is a lot to take in. I'll have the nurse give you some information on our treatment options, and we can schedule a follow-up appointment to discuss your decision. We left the office in a daze, clutching pamphlets and appointment cards. The drive home was silent, each of us lost in our own thoughts. As we pulled into our driveway, Beth turned to me, her eyes brimming with unshed tears. We'll get through this, Joseph. We have to. I sat on the edge of our bed, staring at the stack of medical pamphlets on the nightstand. The weight of the decision before us felt crushing. Beth paced back and forth, her brow furrowed in concentration. We have to do the treatment, Joseph, she said, her voice tight with emotion. It's our best chance. I sighed, rubbing my temples. I don't know, Beth. A year of chemo, radiation. For what? A few extra months? Beth stopped pacing, turning to face me. Her eyes flashed with a mix of anger and fear. For what? For us, Joseph. For more time together. And what kind of time will it be, I countered, frustration seeping into my voice. Me, sick and miserable, you exhausted from taking care of me? Beth's shoulders slumped. It doesn't matter, as long as they were together. I stood up, crossing the room to take her hands in mine. Beth, love, I don't want to leave you drowning in medical debt. The treatments are expensive, and there's no guarantee they'll work. Money doesn't matter, Beth exclaimed, pulling her hands away. Your life matters. My quality of life matters too, I said softly, and yours. Beth's eyes filled with tears. So what? You're just giving up. You're not even going to try. The accusation stung. That's not fair. I'm trying to be realistic. Realistic? Beth's voice rose. There's nothing realistic about this situation, Joseph. It's not fair. It's not right. But it's what we've got, and I'm not ready to lose you. Her words hung in the air between us. I turned away, walking to the window. Outside, life went on as normal. A neighbor mowed his lawn. Kids rode bikes down the street. The contrast with the turmoil in our bedroom was jarring. I'm scared, Beth. I admitted my voice barely above a whisper. I'm scared of the pain, of being a burden, of... of dying. I heard her soft footsteps behind me, felt her arms wrap around my waist. She pressed her forehead against my back. I'm scared too, she murmured, but we can face this together. Please, Joseph, please try. I turned in her embrace, looking down at her tear-stained face. The love and determination I saw there made my throat tight. Okay, I said, my own eyes welling up. Uh, okay, we'll try the treatment. 
Beth's relief was palpable. She stood on her tiptoes, pressing a soft kiss to my lips. Thank you, she whispered. I pulled her closer, burying my face in her hair. I'm sorry for even considering giving up. You're right. Every moment we have together is precious. Beth leaned back, cupping my face in her hands. We're in this together, remember? For better or worse. I managed a small smile. In sickness and in health. Exactly, Beth nodded, a determined glint in her eye. We'll fight this, Joseph, with everything we've got. I took a deep breath, feeling a mix of fear and resolve settle over me. All right, then. Let's call Dr. Patel and set up the treatment plan. Beth squeezed my hand. I'll be with you every step of the way. As we moved to the phone, I felt a flicker of hope. The road ahead would be hard, but with Beth by my side, I felt stronger. Whatever came next, we would face it together. The news of my condition spread like wildfire through our extended family and social circles. My phone buzzed constantly with messages of concern and support. At first, I tried to respond to each one, but it quickly became overwhelming. The constant reminders of my illness were draining, both emotionally and physically. One evening, as I sat on the couch, scrolling through yet another flood of well-meaning messages, I made a decision. With a few taps, I deactivated my social media accounts. The sudden silence was both a relief and oddly unsettling. Are you sure about this? Beth asked, settling beside me with a cup of tea. I nodded, setting my phone aside. I need to focus on getting better, not on managing everyone else's feelings about my illness. Beth squeezed my hand. I understand. I'll help field calls and keep people updated if you'd like. The next day, we drove to the hospital for my first round of chemotherapy. The treatment room was filled with reclining chairs and IV stands. Other patients in various stages of treatment occupied some of the chairs. Their gaunt faces and bald heads were a stark reminder of what lay ahead for me. A nurse led us to an empty chair and began explaining the procedure. I half listened, my eyes drawn to the clear bag of chemicals that would soon be coursing through my veins. Beth asked questions, her voice steady despite the tremor in her hands as she clutched my arm. The insertion of the IV was quick, but uncomfortable. As the drugs began to flow, I closed my eyes, trying to imagine them as healing warriors, battling the cancer cells. Beth sat beside me, reading aloud from one of our favorite books, her voice a soothing anchor in the sterile, chemical-scented room. Hours later, we returned home. I was exhausted, but determined to act normal. I'm fine, I insisted, waving off Beth's concern, just a bit tired, but... As the days wore on, the side effects hit hard. Nausea rolled over me in waves, leaving me weak and irritable. My hair began to fall out in clumps, clogging the shower drain. Looking in the mirror became an exercise in avoiding my own gaunt reflection. One morning, about two weeks into treatment, I snapped at Beth over something trivial. I think she'd forgotten to buy my favorite cereal. I'm sorry, I said immediately, shame washing over me. I didn't mean that. Beth's smile was strained, but understanding. It's okay, I know you're not feeling well. But I could see the hurt in her eyes, the way she withdrew slightly. It scared me, this change in myself. I was becoming someone I didn't recognize. Someone short-tempered and difficult. That night, I lay awake, listening to Beth's steady breathing beside me. The moonlight cast shadows across our bedroom, and I found myself cataloging the changes. The bottles of medication on the nightstand. The wig stand in the corner the way Beth now slept, facing away from me, as if afraid to disturb me. I reached out, gently touching her shoulder. She stirred, turning to face me. What's wrong? she asked, voice thick with sleep. I'm sorry, I whispered, for everything, for being difficult. Beth propped herself up on one elbow. Joseph, you don't have to apologize. You're going through so much. But you are too, I insisted and I'm not making it any easier. She was quiet for a moment, then said softly, We're both learning how to navigate this. It's okay if we stumble sometimes. I nodded, throat tight with emotion. I love you, Beth, more than I can say. I woke to the soft patter of Beth's footsteps approaching our bedroom. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee wafted through the air, mingling with the scent of buttered toast. I heard the gentle clink of a mug being set down on the nightstand. Good morning, sleepyhead. Beth's voice was warm and cheerful. I thought you might like some breakfast in bed today. I rolled over, 
blinking away the remnants of sleep. Beth stood by the bed, a tray balanced carefully in her hands. Her hair was pulled back in a messy bun, and she wore her favorite faded blue robe. The sight of her, so familiar and comforting, brought a smile to my face. You didn't have to do that, I said, pushing myself up against the headboard. Beth grinned. I wanted to. You've been so strong through all of this. You deserve a little pampering. She took a step forward, her eyes focused on the tray. I noticed a small toy car on the floor, one of the many that had migrated from the living room. Before I could warn her, Beth's foot caught on it. Time seemed to slow. The tray tilted, the mug of coffee sliding towards the edge. Beth's eyes widened in horror as she tried to regain her balance. But it was too late. The mug toppled over, sending a cascade of hot coffee across my lap and chest. Pain seared through me, shocking and immediate. I let out a strangled yell, throwing back the covers in a desperate attempt to escape the scalding liquid. Oh, God, Joseph, I'm so sorry, Beth cried, dropping the tray on the bed and rushing to help. The pain clouded my vision, anger and frustration boiling up inside me. Damn it, Beth, I shouted, my voice raw with pain. Can't you watch where you're going? Beth recoiled as if I'd slapped her. I, I didn't see the car. I'm sorry, I'll get a towel. Just leave it, I snapped, pushing her hands away. Haven't I got enough to deal with without you making things worse? The words left my mouth before I could stop them, harsh and cutting. Beth's face crumpled, tears welling up in her eyes. She took a step back, her hands shaking. I was just trying to do something nice, she whispered, her voice trembling. The hurt in her eyes hit me like a physical blow, cutting through the haze of pain and anger. Shame washed over me, but before I could apologize, Beth turned and fled the room. I sat there, surrounded by the mess of spilled coffee and scattered breakfast, the pain of the burns nothing compared to the ache in my chest. I'd hurt her, the one person who'd stood by me through everything. The realization left me feeling hollow and sick. After a few moments, I heard the bathroom door close and the sound of running water. Beth was probably trying to compose herself to hide her tears from me. The thought made me feel even worse. I gingerly got out of bed, wincing at the pain from the burns. As I changed into clean, dry clothes, I tried to think of how to make things right. But the words seemed inadequate in the face of what I'd done. When I finally worked up the courage to leave the bedroom, I found Beth in the kitchen. She was mechanically wiping down the counter, her movements stiff and her eyes red-rimmed. Beth, I said softly, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have. It's fine, she cut me off, not meeting my eyes. I should have been more careful. Her voice was flat, devoid of its usual warmth. The distance between us felt vast and unfamiliar. I reached out to touch her arm, but she flinched away, turning to rinse out the cloth in the sink. I need to get ready for work, she said, still not looking at me. There's more coffee in the pot if you want it. Without waiting for a response, she left the kitchen. I stood there, feeling lost and helpless. The sound of the bedroom door closing echoed through the house, a finality to it that made my heart sink. I woke to the sound of the doorbell ringing. Glancing at the clock, I saw it was just past noon. Beth must have gone to work hours ago. I hadn't even heard her leave. The lingering effects of my latest chemo session left me groggy and disoriented. The doorbell rang again, more insistently this time. With a groan, I pushed myself out of bed, grabbing my robe and shuffling towards the front door. My legs felt weak, and I had to pause halfway down the hallway to catch my breath. When I finally reached the door and pulled it open, I was stunned to see Papa standing there a weathered duffel bag at his feet. Papa? I blinked, wondering if the chemo drugs were causing hallucinations. What are you doing here? Papa's face crinkled into a smile, though his eyes held a hint of concern. Can't an old man visit his grandson without an interrogation? I stepped back, gesturing for him to come in. Of course, I'm just surprised. We weren't expecting you. Papa hefted his bag and stepped inside, his eyes taking in my disheveled appearance. Looks like I came at a good time. You look like you could use some company. I led him to the living room, suddenly self-conscious of the mess. Pill bottles cluttered the coffee table, and a half-eaten bowl of soup from yesterday sat forgotten on the side table. Sorry about the mess, I muttered, hastily gathering the dishes. I wasn't expecting visitors. Papa waved off my apology. Don't fuss on my account. I've seen worse. He settled into the armchair, his joints creaking audibly. 
Now, how about you sit down and tell your old papa how you're really doing? There was something in his tone, a mix of concern and understanding, that broke through my defenses. I sank onto the couch, suddenly feeling every bit of my illness. It's... It's been tough, Papa, I admitted, my voice barely above a whisper. The treatments, the side effects. Sometimes I wonder if it's worth it. Papa nodded slowly, his weathered hands clasped in his lap. I know that feeling, Joseph. When your grandmother was sick, there were days when she asked me the same thing. I looked up, surprised. Grandma had passed years ago, but we'd never really talked about her illness. She did? Oh, yes. Papa said, his eyes taking on a faraway look. There were times when the pain seemed too much to bear, but you know what kept her going? I shook my head, leaning forward slightly. Love, Papa said simply, love for her family, for the life she'd built, and the knowledge that every day, no matter how hard, was a gift. His words hit me hard, reminding me of the argument with Beth this morning. I felt a lump form in my throat. I think I might have forgotten that, I said quietly. Papa reached out, patting my knee. It's easy to forget when you're in the thick of it, but that's why you've got people who love you, to remind you. We sat in silence for a moment, the weight of his words settling over us. Then Papa cleared his throat, his expression turning serious. Joseph, there's something I need to talk to you about, something important. I straightened up, sensing the shift in his tone. What is it, Papa? He took a deep breath his eyes meeting mine. I want you to promise me something. When my time comes, I want you to make sure I'm cremated. The request caught me off guard. Cremated? But I thought, I mean, Grandma was buried. I assumed you'd want the same. Papa's face darkened slightly. That's exactly why I'm asking this of you. There are reasons, important ones. I leaned back, studying his face. There was something in his expression a mix of fear and determination that I'd never seen before. Okay, Papa, I said slowly, if that's what you want, but can I ask why? Papa's gaze drifted to the window, his voice dropping to almost a whisper. It's a long story, Joseph, one I'm not sure you're ready to hear. Papa shifted in his chair, his weathered hands gripping the armrests as he began his tale. The afternoon light filtering through the curtains cast long shadows across his face, deepening the lines of worry etched there. It was a Tuesday, he began, his voice low and gravelly. We'd just buried your grandmother the day before. I remember it was raining, a soft, misty kind of rain that seemed to hang in the air. I leaned forward, drawn in by the intensity in Papa's eyes. He rarely spoke of Grandma's passing, and never in such detail. I was sitting in the kitchen, trying to force down some toast. The house felt so empty without her. Papa's voice cracked slightly. That's when I heard it, a knock at the door. He paused, swallowing hard. I thought it might be one of the neighbors coming to check on me, but when I opened that door, Joseph, I saw your grandmother standing there. My breath caught in my throat. What do you mean, Papa? How could that be possible? Papa shook his head, his eyes distant. I don't know. But there she was, wearing the blue dress we'd buried her in. She looked alive, but different somehow. I felt a chill run down my spine as Papa continued. She didn't speak, just stood there, staring at me with these eyes that weren't quite right, too bright, too aware for someone who'd been dead for days. Papa's hands trembled slightly as he spoke. I stumbled back, and she... She just walked right in, like she was coming home from a long trip, went straight to the kitchen and started making tea like it was any other day. I tried to process what I was hearing. It seemed impossible, and yet the fear in Papa's voice was undeniably real. What did you do? I asked, my own voice barely above a whisper. I didn't know what to do, Papa admitted. I just watched her, feeling like I was losing my mind. She moved differently, you see, too smooth, like she was gliding instead of walking. He took a shaky breath. I called your father, told him to come over right away. While I waited, she just sat at the kitchen table, sipping her tea and staring at nothing. Papa's eyes met mine, filled with a haunted look. Your father arrived about an hour later, when he saw her. God, Joseph, I've never seen a man look so terrified. 
Uh, I felt my heart racing, caught up in the horror of Papa's story. What happened then? Papa opened his mouth to continue, but then seemed to think better of it. He glanced at the clock on the wall and shook his head. It's getting late, he said, his voice suddenly weary. Maybe we should continue this another time. I wanted to protest, to demand he finish the story. But the exhaustion in Papa's face stopped me. Whatever had happened, reliving it was clearly taking a toll on him. Papa settled back into his chair, his eyes distant as he continued his story. The afternoon light cast long shadows across the room, adding an eerie atmosphere to his tale. Your father arrived about an hour later, Papa said, his voice low, when he saw her. God, Joseph, I've never seen a man look so terrified. I leaned forward, hanging on every word. What did Dad do? Papa's hands trembled slightly as he spoke. He just stood there for a moment, frozen. Then he turned to me and said, We need to check the grave. A chill ran down my spine. You went to the cemetery? Papa nodded. We did. Left her sitting there at the kitchen table, staring at nothing. The drive to the cemetery was the longest of my life. Your father didn't say a word. Just gripped the steering wheel so tight, his knuckles were white. He paused, taking a shaky breath. When we got there, the ground was still soft from the burial. But something was wrong. The earth was disturbed, like something had clawed its way out. I felt my stomach lurch. You mean... We dug, Papa said simply. Dug until we hit the coffin. And when we opened it... He trailed off, his eyes haunted. What? I whispered, dreading the answer. Empty, Papa said. The coffin was empty. Just some scraps of that blue dress left behind. I sat back, trying to process what I was hearing. It seemed impossible, and yet the fear in Papa's voice was undeniably real. We raced back to the house, Papa continued. Your father was muttering something under his breath the whole way. When we got there, she was still in the kitchen, but she'd changed. Changed how? I asked, my mouth dry. Papa's eyes met mine, filled with a mixture of fear and sorrow. Her skin was gray, Joseph, and her eyes, they were black, all black, no whites at all. When she saw us, she smiled, and her teeth... He shuddered visibly. They were sharp, like needles. She stood up, moving faster than anything I've ever seen. Your father, he... He grabbed a kitchen knife. I felt my heart pounding in my chest. What happened next, Papa? It was chaos, Papa said, his voice barely above a whisper. She moved like lightning, Joseph. Your father, he fought like a man possessed. There was a moment when I thought... I thought we were done for. He paused, swallowing hard. But then your father, he managed to... to stab her, right in the heart. She let out this horrible scream, like nothing I've ever heard before, and then... she just crumbled, turned to dust right there on our kitchen floor. I sat in stunned silence, trying to make sense of what I'd just heard. It seemed impossible, like something out of a horror movie, and yet... The pain and fear in Papa's eyes were all too real. We never spoke of it, Papa said softly. Your father and I, we cleaned up the, the remains, buried them in the backyard under the old oak tree. We told everyone she'd passed in her sleep, had a private cremation. He looked at me, his eyes pleading. You understand now, Joseph, why I need to be cremated? We can't risk... We can't let that happen again. I nodded slowly, my mind reeling. I understand, Papa. I promise, when the time comes, I'll make sure you're cremated. Oh. Uh. Papa leaned forward in his chair, his weathered hands clasped tightly in his lap. The late afternoon light cast deep shadows across his face, accentuating the lines of worry etched there. There's one more thing I need to tell you, Joseph, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Something I've never told anyone else. I nodded, bracing myself for whatever revelation was to come. Papa reached into his shirt and pulled out a small vial on a thin silver chain. The vial was no bigger than my thumb, made of dark glass that glinted in the fading light. This, Papa said, his voice thick with emotion, is all I have left of your grandmother. I leaned closer, peering at the vial. What do you mean, Papa? He cupped the vial gently in his palm. After what happened, your father and I, we couldn't take any chances. We cremated what was left of her. This vial contains some of her ashes. I felt a lump form in my throat. 
You've been carrying her with you all this time? Papa nodded, his eyes glistening with unshed tears. Every day since we lost her, it's my way of keeping her close and, and making sure she can't come back. The weight of his words hung heavy in the air between us. I struggled to find something to say, but Papa continued before I could speak. You see, Joseph, what happened to your grandmother? It wasn't just a freak occurrence. There's a name for it in the old country. They call them Strigoi. Strigoi, I repeated, the unfamiliar word feeling strange on my tongue. Papa nodded gravely. Restless spirits that rise from the grave, driven by an insatiable hunger. They're not the people they once were, Joseph. They're something else, something dark and terrible. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat. But Papa, surely you don't believe... He held up a hand, silencing me. I know how it sounds, Joseph, but after what I saw, what your father and I experienced, I can't afford not to believe. Papa's eyes bore into mine, filled with a mixture of fear and determination. There are certain conditions that make a person more likely to become a strigoi, being the seventh child, having red hair, being born with a call, and dying before your time. A chill ran down my spine as the implications of his words sank in. My own battle with cancer, the treatments that were stealing years from my life. That's why I'm telling you this now, Joseph, Papa said, his voice urgent. You need to understand the risks. Promise me, when your time comes, hopefully many, many years from now, you'll insist on cremation. It's the only way to be sure. I nodded slowly, my mind reeling from everything I'd heard. I promise, Papa. I'll make sure of it. I sat alone in the dimming light of the living room, my mind reeling from Papa's incredible story. The house had grown quiet, with Papa retiring to the guest room for a much-needed rest. Outside, the sun was setting, casting long shadows across the room and giving everything an eerie, twilight quality. I rubbed my temples, trying to process everything I'd just heard. The tale of my grandmother rising from the grave, the desperate struggle that followed, and the terrible secret Papa and my father had carried all these years. It seemed impossible, like something out of a horror movie. And yet, the pain and fear in Papa's eyes had been all too real. My gaze drifted to the mantelpiece, where a framed photo of my grandmother stood. Her kind smile and twinkling eyes seemed at odds with the monstrous creature Papa had described. How could that sweet woman have become something so inhuman? I found myself mentally ticking off the conditions Papa had mentioned. Seventh child? No. Red hair? Not me. Born with a call? I didn't think so, but dying before my time? A lump formed in my throat as I thought about my ongoing battle with cancer. The treatments that were meant to save me were also stealing years from my life. Did that put me at risk? Don't be ridiculous, I muttered to myself, shaking my head. It's just a story, an old man's grief playing tricks on him. And yet, I couldn't shake the chill that had settled over me. The image of my grandmother's empty coffin, the disturbed earth above it, kept flashing through my mind. What if it was true? What if there was even the slightest chance? I stood up abruptly, pacing the room. My rational mind rebelled against the very idea of it. Strigoi? Undead creatures rising from the grave? It was absurd, and yet... I found myself at the window, staring out at the deepening twilight. The branches of the old oak tree in the backyard swayed gently in the breeze, and I couldn't help but think about what Papa had said was buried beneath it. My hand went to my chest, feeling the steady beat of my heart. How many more years did I have? How many more sunsets would I see? The treatments were brutal, but I was fighting. I wanted to live, to grow old with Beth, to see our children grow up. Beth. My thoughts turned to my wife, probably still at work, unaware of the strange turn my afternoon had taken. What would she think of all this? She'd probably laugh it off, tell me Papa was just spinning yarns again. But would she understand if I asked her to? Before I could finish the thought, I found myself reaching for my phone. My fingers hovered over Beth's number for a moment before I hit call. It rang twice before she picked up. Hey, honey. Her warm voice came through the speaker. Everything okay? I hesitated for a moment. Yeah, everything's fine. I just... I wanted to talk to you about something. Okay, she said, a note of concern creeping into her voice. What's up? I took a deep breath. It's going to sound weird, but 
I've been thinking. When I die, I want to be cremated. Hey. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Joseph, what's brought this on? Did something happen with your treatment? No, no, I assured her quickly. Nothing like that. It's just something Papa said. It got me thinking, that's all. Oh, Joseph, Beth sighed. What stories has he been telling you now? I chuckled weakly. It's a long story. I'll tell you all about it when you get home. Just promise me you'll make sure it happens, okay? No matter what. There was another pause, longer this time. When Beth spoke again, her voice was soft, filled with a mixture of concern and love. Of course, honey. If that's what you want, I promise I'll make it happen. But are you sure you're okay? I looked out at the darkening sky, at the old oak tree standing sentinel in the yard. Yeah, I said softly. I'm okay. Just thinking about the future, I guess. As I hung up the phone, I felt a strange mix of relief and unease settle over me. I knew Beth probably thought I was being silly, influenced by one of Papa's tall tales. Part of me thought the same thing. But as I stood there in the growing darkness, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed, that in sharing his terrible secret, Papa had passed on not just a story, but a responsibility. A duty to be vigilant, to take precautions against a threat I wasn't even sure I believed in.